are going to shift gears a little bit here and have two uh, uh, historical paleo uh, types of approaches to some of these problems. Uh, our next uh, speaker, Mike Foote, is the professor and chair of uh, the Geophysical Sciences Department at the University of Chicago, uh, where he, uh, he got his PhD and he ran off to other places and then came back. Uh, he's a uh, fellow of the Paleontological Society and he received the uh, Charles uh, Schuchert Award from the Paleo Society. Uh, I, I would have to say that uh, uh, Mike is uh, absolutely the leading quantitative and statistical paleobiologist and theoretician in, probably in the world, you know. And uh, he's made really fundamental contributions to our understanding of, uh, of Phanerozoic diversity, how you count it, what it looks like, and so forth. And so he's going to be talking today about the geological history of biodiversity. Thanks a lot, Joel, and too kind introduction. I uh, want to thank the organizers for inviting me and giving me the chance not only to, to meet a lot of new interesting people I haven't met before, but also to return to my native Long Island for a few days. Um, so when Doug um, asked me to talk about the tiny subject of the history of biodiversity, I thought, how can I actually make this manageable? And um, so I thought that I would just focus on two really uh, relatively small topics, but things that I thought Darwin would have been interested in. Um, and I, I'm inadvertently turning the switch of this mic off. Um, uh, as you, you'll see as the talk progresses that it's very, what I'm going to talk about is very limited in scope, but I, they are, these are things that I think Darwin would have been interested in. So of course, we all know uh, this Victorian gentleman. I would venture to guess very few people here recognize this Victorian gentleman. This is John Phillips, English geologist, who also happens to be the nephew of William Smith, who drew the first geological map of Britain. Um, Rud Martin Rudwick rediscovered, I think I would say rediscovered, uh, some of Phillips' work uh, in the 1970s and sort of brought it to the attention of paleontologists who have uh, been fond of reproducing this figure from Phillips' 1860 book, A Life on the Earth, Its Origin and Succession, um, as what we like to think of as the first diversity curve, the first Phanerozoic global diversity curve. Of course, it's a model, and um, you know, those of you who talk to geochemists, you'll sometimes hear the expression a Caltech plot, which is a plot of something against nothing. This is, <laughs> this is what I, I like to refer to as a Yale plot. It's a plot of nothing against nothing. You'll see that <laughs> neither, neither of the axes is labeled, but presumably this is geologic time and this is the level of diversity. Now, I want to come back to how, uh, how Phillips came, upon, came about with this curve because it's relevant to one of the themes I want to talk about, which is how we deal with the incompleteness of the geologic record, which is, of course, something Darwin was concerned about. Two more characters in this narrative are seen here, Jack Sapkowski and Arnie Miller uh, on, a, on a field trip, and they will be very important uh, in, the sort of, in the development Arnie, both in the development of how we deal with incompleteness, and both of them in the uh, development of the other idea, which is evidence for the proposition that biotic interaction has shaped the largest scale patterns in the history of biodiversity. So coming back to Darwin, um, in terms of biotic interaction, Darwin in this passage essentially lays out the, the idea that if you could bring present day and ancient organisms face to face, the present day organisms would surely outcompete the ancient ones. Now, he didn't say this, be in my reading of Darwin, he didn't say this because he had good reason, good anatomical and ecological reasons for, for arguing that living organisms are superior. He says that this logically follows as a sort of uh, an outcome of his theory. If the, the populations and individuals that are better suited to their environment are, are sort of getting ahead by natural selection, then if you just extrapolate that over time, assuming that climate and environment are roughly constant, it inevitably follows that, that living organisms must be superior or, or have a competitive edge over ancient organisms. He, in my reading of this, he seems uncomfortable with this idea, but he says it's just a logical necessity. Later in the passage, in fact, he uh, 
also makes note of the fact that when British organisms have been introduced to New Zealand, they flourish, whereas when New Zealand species come to Britain, they don't flourish. And so he's not comfortable with the idea that somehow the British fauna is superior, but it sure, sure seems that way. And of course, one of the other things Darwin was concerned about was the imperfection of the geological record. And again, I would say in my reading of him, it's not so much that he, has, he feels he has solid evidence for how bad the record is, but the fact that we see sudden transitions and the sudden appearance of major biologic groups leads him to suppose that because those, the suddenness can't be real under his theory, it has, there must be more gradual change, leads him to think that the record must be incomplete. So, Given that, that The Origin is published in 1859 and Phillips's book is published in 1860, I want to know, well, what did Phillips think about Darwin and his view of the, view of the history of life, and mo particularly his view of the uh, incompleteness of the record? Now, unfortunately, the University of Chicago Library does not have a copy of Phillips's book, so I did what any modern scholar would do. I went to Google Books and found that there is a scanned version f uh, of Phillips's book on Google Books, fully searchable. So I just type Darwin into the little search field and out come the passages from the book where he discusses this. And the key one I want to refer, uh, refer to here is basically where he says Darwin's view of the incompleteness of the geological record is overstated. That Darwin is basically putting this forward because he has to, not because he has good reason, uh, to, not, not because he has good evidence for it. And Phillips goes on to say that, yeah, sure, if you go from one locality to another, you won't see the entire succession of the Phanerozoic, but if you assemble the entire globe, you really get a rich idea of the transitions in the history of life. So he thinks we're getting a good view of this. So here is a, a tabulation that Phillips put together, actually just of British fossil species, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, divided into different groups, and he has the total here. So it looks like we've got a lot of species in the Paleozoic, intermediate number in the Mesozoic, uh, somewhat fewer in the Cenozoic. A decline in diversity from the Paleozoic to the present day. But he says, we know that in Great Britain, the represent representation of Paleozoic rocks is more complete, so what we have to do is correct for that by looking at the thickness of strata. We have more Paleozoic strata, we have less Mesozoic and less still Cenozoic, so if we divide the number of species by the thickness, we get an estimate of the number of species per foot, and we see that diversity has gone up. And this is how Phillips gets this diversity curve. It's a model. It's not an actual tabulation of species. And the point I would make is that every diversity curve I'm going to show, every diversity curve anyone ever shows is a model. It's not just a count. Sometimes it is just a count, but then the implicit model is I can take the record at face value and don't have to do any correction. Okay? It's always a model of some sort. Now, Phillips also looked at the composition, not just the number of species. And here he has, uh, in the different colors, some, uh, the, he has different groups of organisms here, these are all uh, animals, and simply the relative numbers, and he has basically a sort of a more ancient set of species, intermediate and more modern. And we see how the composition has changed. I don't want to go into the details here, but this general idea will be familiar to some of you um, who've seen Sapkowski's factor analysis of the fossil record, where here, based on families that have co-varying diversity histories, he establishes a Paleozoic, uh, I'm sorry, a Cambrian, Paleozoic, and modern fauna, and looks at the relative diversity uh, of those. Interestingly, uh, shortly before this meeting, I was talking to Arnie Miller about some of this work and, and Phillips's role, and Arnie scanned for me the colorized version of this figure that Jack Sapkowski had given him to give a talk at a meeting in 1982. And there is that scan. And although it doesn't look very good, he uses the exact same colors that Phillips used. And under, using certain assumptions, I estimated that the probability that this would have happened by, that the colors would have matched by chance is about 4%. So we can assume that Sapkowski borrowed Phillips's numbers. But more important for what I want to talk about today is Sapkowski's interpretation of that curve. Sapkowski imported a sort of island biogeography models across many scales in the hierarchy from sort of individuals within populations and communities up to families at the global level looking at diversity. But he modeled this history of diversity as, whoops, <coughs> as a three-phase coupled logistic model where each phase has a carrying capacity and it is, it is essentially inhibited by the total diversity in the system. And you can empirically scale the turnover rates and carrying capacities to essentially get a reasonable fit uh, to that family level 
to the family level data. So Sapkowski is sort of putting forth the proposition that at a very large scale, the history of life we see is consistent with diversification being limited by some kind of diffuse bi biotic interaction, where the, the number of taxa present limits the diversification of other taxa. And this is the theme I want to pick up. Now, Sapkowski is not the first person to suggest that there might have been an equilibrium in diversity. This is a figure from uh, Dave Raup's 1972 science paper where he puts forth a model that there may have been equilibrium diversity for some period of time with the apparent increase in diversity being an artifact of an improvement in the quality of sampling. Getting back to Sapkowski, one of the interesting things here is that, of course, he could modify his model to take the empirical perturbations of mass extinction uh, into consideration. Uh, and one of the things I think that's, that's uh, important to keep in mind and is often overlooked in, in this model is that these, the perturbations are transient. That is, they don't have a long-term effect on the shape of the diversity curve. The three phases do eventually get back to where they would have, in terms of numbers, not in terms of the exact composition, but in terms of numbers, they get back to where they would have been if the perturbations had never occurred, again, according to this model. Now, there are, have been, of course, alternative models put forth based on, this is, for example, genus level data for, from Sapkowski. A number of people have argued that the most appropriate model for the history of diversity is essentially an exponential increase, not with, with re very little damping um, and very little evidence for biotic interaction shaping it. Partly, I think that this is uh, this sort of uh, interpretation of exponential growth may be an artifact of the fact that this end of the curve, which, which the recent end, which pins so much of the apparent exponential increase, is probably grossly inflated by the fact that we have better sampling here and by the fact that, the pre that, the, that many of these taxa are alive today and that essentially allows us to pull their stratigraphic ranges uh, forward in time further than we would be able to do if we, were based, uh, if we were basing this curve only on the fossil record. So what we need to do is come up with some ways of undoing these, these potential sampling problems. Um, this is some ev gives you some evidence for the, uh, the change in sampling where, again, from Raup 72 paper, we see different tabulations of diversity at the family and genus level, and Raup later did this at the species level, showing overall similarity with the amount of geologic, uh, with the amount of sedimentary rock that's preserved. So what we want to do is go about trying to uh, uh, sort of sort out the sampling problems. There are a number of ways that, have, that, are, that can be, uh, this can be done, and I don't want to survey them all, but what I would like to sort of uh, put forth is a very simple approach where we try, to un we try to even out the sampling with this procedure called sampling standardization, where if we have the right kind of data, we can go in after the fact and essentially say, what would our temporal patterns look like if we took the same quota of data from each time interval? Then we can essentially develop mathematical models of incomplete sampling that allow us to say, in a forward sense, if we had a certain true pattern of, say, origination, extinction, and sampling, what would the distorted pattern look like? And then the third part of this is saying, now that we have the observed pattern, which we know is distorted, how do we essentially do the inverse procedure through that model to try to estimate out what the, what the, uh, uh, what the true history may have been? Now, an important development here is, the, is databases that have the kind of information that allow us to sort of do some kind of sampling standardization. This is a, a data sheet from a project that Miller and Sapkowski did in the 80s where we have a list of taxa coming from a particular locality. But the important thing, if you focus in here, is that we have various geologic, environmental, and temporal information so that we don't just have a sort of first and last appearance of each genus. We have uh, multiple appearances within the history of that genus, each one with sort of contextual information. And this is sort of what it looks like when you put it into DBase 3 for you, those of you who remember the old days. And so Miller first applied this, uh, applied this kind of uh, approach uh, in the 1990s to try to estimate what the history of diversity would have looked like through the Ordovician radiation, when there's a large proliferation of taxa, if sampling were essentially uniform. And uh, in the late 90s then, I, Charles, tell me if I'm wrong about this, Charles Marshall and John Alroy were talking about this, this work of Miller's and thought, 
Wouldn't it be great if we all got together and essentially did for the entire Phanerozoic, for the entire globe, what Miller did for the Ordovician? And this led ultimately to the paleobiology database, which for us is basically the, the gen bank of paleobiology. It's a large digital archive of the published paleontological record, and it's growing every day. So it's basically a, a kind of detailed, sophisticated version of that handwritten data sheet that you saw, but now it's digitally available and it's constantly being updated. So I won't go uh, bother with this. It's a lot of contextual information and lists of taxa for a number of collections. Now, in terms of modeling incompleteness, there are two key, two key aspects of this. One is that sampling varies. So if we just sort of look at the simple model where sampling is the red curve, uh, we have the true extinction, say, being constant in this simple model, but sampling has a sort of deficit in one time interval. What will happen here is because we won't pick up the extinctions that actually happened in that time interval, there will be an artificially low extinction rate, but those last appearances still have to occur somewhere, and they will occur in the previous time interval or the one before or the one before. So this sampling gap is preceded by an artificial spike in extinction. Likewise, the sampling gap would be, would be followed by an artificial spike in origination. And a sampling peak instead of a trough would just cause this whole curve to be flipped upside down. So we can model the exact form of the effects of variable sampling. There's also a problem, even if sampling is uniform, if there's true variation in rates of origination and extinction, then we will not always capture them. So here we have a true spike in extinction, but because we don't capture all the extra extinctions in that time interval, the, the extinction spike gets smeared back. And the lower is the rate of sampling, the more it gets smeared back. And likewise, an, an origination spike would be smeared forward. Okay? But we can model these and then through this inverse procedure try to get at what the true histories were. And we have equations to do that. And taking some sample standardized data and running it through these optimization procedures, this is what we get for the history of Phanerozoic origination at the genus scale. Um, I'm going to focus on the time span from the mid Ordovician to the, to the, uh, through the Paleogene because we have some edge effects that are, that are really troubling and so I'll focus on this. And I'm really for this particular purpose not interested in any long-term trends, so I'm going to detrend it and look at the residuals. There we have for origination, here we have for extinction, here we have net diversification, which is just the difference between origination and extinction. I don't want to talk about the details of these curves. I want to get to something else. And here we have diversity looking like much less like that sort of unfettered exponential increase. In fact, virtually no net change for most of the history. And then an upturn here of less than twofold. Okay? And again, the residuals. <clears throat> what I want to do now is look for direct evidence of diversity dependence of diversification, origination, and extinction rates. And the way I'm doing this is simply to look at the residuals in diversity at the beginning of the time interval versus the net rate in the succeeding time interval. Okay? So it's the most proximal diversity. What uh, impact does ha that have on the rate? And we see that for net diversification rate, there's a negative correlation. Okay, which is a reasonable evidence for diversity dependence of diversification rate. When diversi diversity is higher, you have less diversification. When diversity is lower, you have more diversification. Shouldn't seem all that counterintuitive, and yet the claim has often been made that this is not the case. Interestingly, we can, I don't want to spend much time on this, but we can break this down into two components. Essentially, the situation when diversity is lower than average, we have this negative correlation. So when you're below the long-term trend, there's an acceleration of diversification, which Jonathan mentioned earlier. But when you're above the trend, there's very, very little effect. In other words, there's no strong tendency for diversification to be damped downward when diversity is higher. But there is a tendency for it to be pushed up when diversity is lower. If we look at origination, the origination component itself, we see a negative correlation. And again, the same pattern where the negative, uh, the, the damping seems to be more in the negative residuals. And has been found many times before, if we look at ex extinction, there doesn't seem to be much evidence for, uh, for um, damping. 
I mean, we do have a correlation here, but it's very weak and it's certainly not, not significant. This, this is a point that has been made many times before, that the diverse, diversity dependence of diversification seems to be concentrated in the origination term. Low diversity promotes origination, but high diversity doesn't seem to cause extinction or to promote extinction. But if we divide this into, again, the negative and positive residuals, there's a hint of a possible different pattern where maybe when, diver maybe when diversity is higher than average, there is some tendency for extinction to be higher, although it's very weak and noisy. Okay, so I don't want to make too much of that. So we have the possibility of a slightly different diversity dependence model than has often been portrayed. This would be a sort of standard model where the one that Sapkowski would have used where as a function of diversity you have an increase in extinction rate and a decrease in origination rate, whereas another possibility is that you have a decrease in origination up to a point and then there's not much of effect. And then you have per, per, ver, relatively little influence on extinction with the possible hint of an increase in, in extinction rate when diversity is higher. Now I should say that this is sort of an idea, this, this I think supports the proposition that there's some biotic interaction contributing to the dynamics of diversification, but it doesn't point to any particular uh, kind of interaction. I mean, we often talk about this as, as possi the possible effects of competition, but just for an, as an, for an example, Steve Stanley has argued that, in fact, this is more likely the, the effect of, of predation. He argues that in the extinction events, because of their low population densities, predator species go extinct at a higher rate than prey species, and that those rebounds are the prey species diversifying in the relative absence of predators. So it needn't indicate competition. It could be something else. Another a, a case study at a, a somewhat smaller scale is uh, by Miller and Sapkowski on the bivalves, where is a really interesting pattern is this is diversity on a log scale over time long-term growth that's at a nearly constant rate except for these extinction, these perturbations at extinctions, rapid rebounds, but then the amazing thing about this is when you get back to where you would have been, you just keep going. Now that's not what you expect in an undamped exponential system. This is what, this is what you expect in some kind of interactive system. And in fact, they modeled this as a two-phase coupled logistic model where the bivalves were essentially one phase and the the other phase was everything else, the entire rest of the biota. Now one thing that I, I, I think would be worth doing that I, I don't really know and I don't think anyone has figured out how to sort these two out is to, is to test an alternative model here rather than this being a coupled logistic model with homogeneous parameters throughout history, which does fit this well, the idea that it's essentially quasi-equilibrial in that at any given time you have this diversity dependence of the rates, but what you're really doing is tracking a carrying capacity which itself is evolving over time. The carrying capacity itself is going up. And you could think about the same question with the global diversity data. Uh, are we really sort of looking at a carrying capacity that's per perhaps stable for much of the history of life but then starts, go uh, starts going up, which is not the same as the homogeneous logistic system. Um, just to show that, that uh, the bivalve curve uh, looks the same if we do sample standardization and modeling, this is a sort of revised curve where what I've, the, the solid line here shows essentially a non-parametric uh, low S smoothing of the data. The red line shows the exponential fit and the two are fairly close. So, so I think Miller and Sapkowski still got basically the right pattern uh, even if we do the sample standardization of the data uh, followed by the sort of optimization of the rates. And I'll skip these. I want to talk about one last case study uh, that, that relates back uh, to, to what uh, Jonathan was talking about earlier. And this has been put forth as perhaps the, the best example of, the, of possible competition mediating long-term uh, diversification dynamics where we actually think we might know something about, about the sort of actual ecological mechanism. So these are two groups of uh, bryozoans, uh, cyclostomes and chylostomes. Chylostomes begin radiating in the, la in the late Jurassic. Uh, even though cyclostomes are not really declining in diversity, they certainly are not, are not winning the game relative to chylostomes. Now these are, these are ecologically similar taxa, most of which are encrusting on hard, hard substrates and are known to co compete for space, and I'll get back to this. This is global diversity at the genus level, but we see this same pattern if we go to the local scale. Here we take individual assemblages and simply look at the percentage of the species in that locality that belong to the two groups, 
and we can see that the percentage of cyclostomes declines through this time interval. And it's not only species diversity, it's actually the sort of biomass as well, because if we look at the skeletal biomass, again, the percentage that uh, can be attributed to cyclostomes, that's going down through this interval of time. So we really have not just a global diversity pattern, but an alpha level ecological shift in the relative importance of these two groups. Why might this be? Well, Ken McKinney has pointed out that we can find situations in which we know that, the, that colonies of the two kinds of taxa were competing uh, because they're on the same hard substrate, and we can track which one actually eventually overgrew the other and, and took over the substrate. Now, you can say, well, how do you know that maybe the, the, the one colony was already dead, the other one landed on the substrate and overgrew it? What you have to do is find those cases where there's mutual overgrowth. So you see here, this is the chylostome, this is the cyclostome. The chylostome is overgrowing the cyclostome here. The cyclostome is overgrowing the chylostome there. Therefore, you, knew, you know that the two colonies were alive at the same time and they were actually interacting. And when you find cases like this, you then score who ultimately took over the majority of the substrate. And what McKinney found is that over a time span of 100 million years, there's a, a, the chylostomes have an advantage where they win about two-thirds of these, of these competitive interactions, and that doesn't change over time. So we have some evidence of competitive superiority of chylostomes. Uh, at the same time, we have this evidence of their increase in both ecological dominance and in diversity dominance over time. But then we get to the question of why? Wait a second. But and this is the theme that has come up a few times, it's not enough to say that ecologically they're somehow better. How does that contribute to a difference in origination and extinction rates? Okay, so the first thing you might think is, well, maybe if they're sup competitively superior, they're going, to be, they're going to go extinct at a lower rate, and so therefore that's going to give them the edge. So we can actually look at that. Let me go forward here um, and say, well, here's the extinction rate of chylostomes averaged over that 100 million year time span. Here's the extinction rate of cyclostomes. There's no difference. So we can't attribute it to, to extinction. Whoops. Now, Sapkowski and colleagues were aware that there's no extinction rate between these two. And they tried to make sense of the different diversity history. And they, too, modeled this as a sort of coupled logistic system where there's one phase, which is essentially cyclostomes, one phase, which is essentially chylostomes. And what you can do is, by fitting the rates empirically to the data, you can get a two-phase model that looks pretty much like the history of chylostomes and cyclostomes. So what all the, the ability to fit this model simply says that you can make a convincing case that the, that the, his, the, the history of origination, extinction, and diversity is consistent with this interaction model. But I, I still feel that leaves us with an important open question, which is, nonetheless, if that, e if that ecological difference is relevant to this diversity history, we still have to say, how does it contribute to different rates of diversification? We've already seen that there's no difference in uh, rates of extinction. But here is a huge difference in rates of genus origination. Chylostomes up here with about three times the origination rate of cyclostomes. So chylostomes are winning the game not because they're res resisting extinction, but because they are producing new taxa at three times the rate. But it still leads to me a, a, you know, a, 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 an unanswered question, and I think this is in so many studies of diversification. Why do we have organismal traits, or how do organismal traits contribute to differential rates of production of new species or differential uh, resistance to extinction? I don't think this question is answered. We have sort of some, a plausibility case. There's ecological superiority. There's differential uh, growth and diversity. But why? How does being able to overgrow your competitor on a substrate give you three times the rate of origination? This is something we just, we still don't know. And I think this is one of the big unanswered questions. So to, to, to sum up then, uh, in, in, in terms of, I think, things that Darwin would have been, would have been interested in seeing that we're doing now, um, I think we've got ways to, to address his concerns about the incompleteness of the fossil record. Now, partly this is because we've, we've thought about how to process the data, but it's also because we got more data. I mean, the fossil record, the, our knowledge of the fossil record is so much better than it was in Darwin's day. So it wasn't unreasonable for Darwin to make some of the claims he did because we knew so much less about the history of life back then. But we know a lot more now, and we know how to accommodate, uh, accommodate the data with models of incompleteness.
I think it's pretty clear that uh, we have good sort of prima facie evidence that long, not just sort of uh, short-term interactions, but long-term trends in biodiversity are shaped by interactions between, uh, bet between taxa um, at, at small scales and at, and at large scales, uh, even though we don't necessarily know the nature of, of that interaction. I think this, bio, this the sort of shaping of diversity trends by biotic interaction could be accommodated by at least two different models, which to me are conceptually very different. One is a sort of homogeneous model where there's a sort of logistic dynamics with constant parameters over time. It gives you the sort of shape of the diversity curves we see. But another possibility is a quasi-equilibrial model where the carrying capacity itself is evolving for complex reasons, and diversification is tracking that uh, in, a, in a damped sense by, uh, especially in response to, to uh, perturbation. And the last thing I would say is I think a big task in front of us is to try to figure out how organismal traits link to rates of production of new taxa and rates of extinction of existing taxa. I'll stop there. Thank you.